our next speaker basically needs no introduction. Uh, Masashi, uh, take it away. Thank you. Jumapu Sugiyama. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, my talk is about noise robust classification. So let's consider a very standard supervised learning problem with noisy output. So in the case of regression on the left-hand side, so this is just, just a standard case. We have input X and output Y and output value is noisy. So it's Y bar here. Then usually we just perform these squares. So we fit our model G of X to Y bar. And this works well in, in regression. But in the case of classification, actually the story is not that simple, unfortunately. So in the case of classification, noise is basically label flipping. But in the case of regression, it's just additive noise. So this is the difference. Then in the classification case, again, we usually naively fit our model G of X to Y bar noisy labels and minimize some cross entropy loss or whatever. So does it really work? Unfortunately, so in the case of regression, yes. But in the case of classification, it's not really true. Even if we have infinitely many noisy labels, still our solution can, cannot be optimal. So that means we need some explicit mechanism to reduce the label noise, to, to copy the label noise. So that's the starting point of this result. So this is a very classic and kind of naive problem, but it was not solved yet. So then to copy this problem already, so this is quite well known and many people have tried many different approaches. So maybe one of the most standard approaches to use unsupervised outlier removal. So given some, some clean, more clean points and noisy points, we try to you know, get rid of noisy points by some outlier removal techniques. So this is fine if it works, but in practice, maybe outlier detection is harder than the classification problem itself. Then maybe it's not that easy to really do outlier removal in a, in a reliable way. Then some people may want to use robust loss functions in robust statistics. And again, this works quite well for regression. So instead of the least squared, squared loss, we may use the Huber loss so that so the effect of outlier is kind of uh, reduced, suppressed. And we can extend that idea also to classification. So instead of the like, squared hinge loss, we, we may use the Huber classification loss or even ramp loss. So it's a upper bounded risk uh, loss. And in practice, Okay, we can somehow obtain a little bit robust solution from these robust loss functions, even in a classification case, but maybe it's not that, that robust as, as regression case. Then finally, so people may want to use regularization. So smoothing the solution to avoid overfitting. So this is always available for any problems. And again, in regression, so this is quite nice, but in the case of classification, so like in, in this case, so if we regularize the solution, we have a nice smooth solution like this. Oh. But once we have some outliers here and there, label noise here and there, then you know, smoothing is actually not that useful anymore. So we need to over smooth our solution to you know, get rid of the effect of noise. Then the solution is not good. So we need new approaches to really cope with label noise. Then let me give you some brief technical background. So let's say so X and Y are clean training data and noisy versions are X and Y bar. So let's consider C class classification problem. So then we consider probabilistic classifier in simplex. So it's H of X. So it's a C minus one vector. So all elements are non-negative and sum to one. And each element of the classifier is expected to approximate the class posterior probability, the P of Y given X. And we consider some lo loss function. Then, so in this scenario, so it's actually quite useful to consider the so-called noise transition matrix, T. So let's say in the three class case, it's a three by three matrix. And like here, one zero zero means class one is always correct and it, it doesn't flip to two or three. But point one, point eight, point one. So this means class two is true only with 80%. And it can become class one or class three with, with 10%. Or 0.5, 0 0.50. So this is really a bad case. So class three label is never true. And it, it always becomes class one or two with 50%. So noise transition matrix T encodes this kind of information. So probability of flipping Y to Y bar. And this is actually quite useful 
And for example, we have some cognitive bias. Like we don't make a mistake between dog and cat. But within the dog class, we have some specific species and it's quite hard to recognize. We often make problem, you know, mistakes in, in those classes. So we should be able to encode that kind of information in this noise transition matrix. And also, this can be visualized as a simplex. So like 100 zero zero uh, zero zero corresponds to the top node, node and 010 zero zero corresponds to this one, and 001 zero zero one corresponds to this one. If, if noise is simplex, then it is something like this. Uh, if it's noise is pairwise, like this, and general, so we have something like this. So I, I will use this visualization later. Then here's a key paper, so proposed by Patrini et al. in CVPR 2017. So they proposed the systematic loss correction methods to handle noisy labels. So this is a, a really an excellent paper. So they proposed two methods. So one is called forward correction. So basically the matrix T is a kind of playing the role of adding noise. So they actually applied T transpose to the classifier eight then somehow it can emulate the noisy output of the classifier. Then this can be matched with noisy labels in a, in a consistent way. So by that, they can achieve so-called classifier consistency. The minimizer of the clean loss is equivalent to the minimizer of the noisy uh, forward corrected loss like this. Ah, so this pattern is actually quite not easy to use. Then the second method is called backward correction. So T is adding noise. Then T inverse is basically removing noise. So they apply T inverse to the vectorized loss function. So each element is the width you know, loss like this. Well, so then, so by using this backward loss function, so they can show that, so classifier consistency and risk consistency are both achieved. So again, the classifier consistency agrees the, the minimum. And then risk consistency say that the, the true risk can be estimated in an unbiased way like this. So this means, so if T is given, so consistency can be guaranteed. So this is a really you know, good, good theory. But in practice, we don't know T. So how to estimate T from noisy data? So that's the starting point of our research. So we wanted to write you know, this paper by ourselves, but it was done previously by these guys. So we joined the, from the second stage. So, <laughs> But the problem is actually T is non-identifiable in general. Like, uh, T can be actually decomposed into the product of two transition matrices, U and V. So then, so we can basically manipulate the solution in an arbitrary way. So then to avoid this problem, we may assume some strong condition like anchor point. So anchor points are the, the training point that has 100% certain samples, basically no, noisy, no, no, noisy label. So then given anchor points, so we can estimate T naively in, in this way. So H bar is a probabilistic classifier learned from noisy training data. So given noisy data, we just train a classifier in a standard way and use this output as T if, if there's an anchor point. Even if anchor points are unknown, but we can guarantee that anchor point exists in our training data, then we may find anchor points by choosing the one that has the probability closest to one. So this is a just approximate implementation, but it could be useful. However, so it is known that, so if we use deep learning to obtain a classifier, then it is often overconfident. So meaning that even if the you know, probability, the output is quite uncertain, but deep learning gives it like almost perfect or something like that. It's quite overconfident. And this is problematic in, in this kind of foundation. Then to overcome this problem, we made some effort to improve it. And okay, the solution was slightly improved, but still the problem was not really solved yet. So that was our like basic result so far. Then, so recently we had two nice solutions to overcome some, some existing problems. And one is called a single step approach. So the previous approaches are basically in two steps. In the first step, so given noisy data, we try to estimate the noise transition matrix T and obtain T hat. Then use this T hat to train a classifier. So that was the you know, pre previous approach. But clearly, so step one is done without regard to the step two. So this means that, so 
step one contains some error, then this small error can be magnified in step two because we didn't care the step two at all in the step one. So ideally, we want to solve step one and two at the same time. So estimating t and hx at the same time. So this is what we want to do. So the problem is simple, but actually solving this is not that straightforward because we can just formulate a problem in this way. So let's minimize the loss with respect to both the noise transition matrix and classifier at the same time and minimize them. So formulation is easy, but again, the solution is not unique because so you can be changed, U and H can be changed with some transition matrix Q, invertible one as this Q inverse T and Q transpose PX. So for any Q, this is a solution. So we want to have some constraint to make Q identity. Then we can recover the true solution. Then how can we do that? So we found that noise transition, so noise transition is a transformation of a vector. And we found that this transformation is actually a contraction in total variation distance. So meaning that if you have two vectors, Px and Px prime, then it's transformed version U transpose Px and U transpose Px prime. So this has smaller L1 norm than the original one. So once we apply U transpose noise transition, then so vectors become closer basically in, in this simplex. If this is intuitively under, understandable because cleaner class posteriors have larger total variations, they are more separated. But once they become noisier, noisier, they are getting closer. Maybe it's quite natural. So let's use this knowledge as a regularizer. So we have the first term. So this is just the expected loss and we want to minimize. So with respect to U and H, this one. And now we have an addi additional regularizer so that so two vectors have larger L1 distance in this way. And we just sample some X and X prime. Then under the un anchor point assumption, so we can show that the, the empirical solution has a statistical consistency. So we can really solve the problem in one step. So that's the first result we obtain. So this is, I think, quite, quite strong uh, theoretically. Then the second method. So to overcome the non-identifiability of T, initially, so we assumed anchor points were explicitly used. So we are given, so this is a class one anchor point, class two anchor point, and like that. So this was extremely strong. Then, so this condition has been relaxed to only the existence of anchor points. We are given a training set, and we don't know which one are anchor points, but at least there exists some anchor points in the training set. That was the second approach. Then, so can we further relax this assumption? So that's the question here. So uh, as I showed, T can be visualized as a simplex in this way. And actually each training point can be also plotted in, in, in this simplex. And actually uh, generally the simplex contains all training points. But unfortunately given a finite number of you know, training points and such a simplex that contains all training data is not unique. So we can consider many different you know, triangles and all can be solutions. Then, so anchor points are actually vertices of the true simplex. So then from this visualization, it's clear, it's clear that given explicit anchor points, we can recover the true triangle. And so this is the, the previous solution actually. So then the second one, so only the existence of anchor points still guarantees the identifiability of T. So now uh, triangles are, uh, it, uh, the vert vertices of the triangles are not really specified, but we know that there exist anchor points. So that was the, the second condition. Then our new work actually extended this idea to a more general setting, what we call sufficiently scattered training data. So today I didn't prepare any equation for, for this method, but once training data are kind of sufficiently scattered in, in this triangle, then we can still obtain the solution uniquely in a consistent way. So intuitively, so previously we assumed that so point exists here and here and here. So from that we can recover the triangle. So that's the intuition. But now in our new condition, so we are saying that so like, suppose like two points exist on 
each edge like this. Then we can recover this triangle. So the extension was something like this. Then, so this is actually, so as a special case, the previous solution was included. So this is a more general condition than the previous one. So as long as training points are sufficiently scattered out, then we can guarantee the consistency with the algorithm shown here. It's called volume minimization. So the first term is the same. So it's the expected loss function. And we minimize this with respect to U and H. But now we have some volume constraint here, volume regularization here. Then, so we consider a big triangle in the beginning and we shrink it. And, and then, so we try to contain all training points with the minimum volume. Then we can show that. So this is actually a consistent algorithm. So we can recover the, the true triangle if data points are sufficiently scattered. So that's the latest result. And as far as we know, this is the most general approach so far in this framework. Okay, that was a good, good conclusion so far, but still the, the you know, problem did not really solved yet in real world. Because so far our focus was so-called class conditional noise. So we, we consider the noise transition matrix T. So that was basically a flipping probability from Y to y, y bar, independent of X. So on the 2D space, basically noise is uniformly distributed in this way. But in reality, maybe we have more noise near decision boundaries, for example. Maybe this is more natural. So this scenario is called instance-dependent noise. And now the matrix T is a function of X. So this is really a big headache. So extremely challenging problem. So, so far we basically gave up solving this theoretically and we just resort to heuristics. Like, like for example, T can be decomposed into some parts and we use like non-negative matrix factorization type algorithm to you know, recover each part. Or we assume some additional confidence scores. So class posterior probability to help estimate the noise transition function. Or we may assume some smoothness over the manifold in a semi-supervised learning way then T is now a smooth function of X and we can somehow estimate it easily. So we added like more condition, more heuristic conditions and try to solve the problem. And these methods are sometimes useful if the you know, assumption behind are you know, relatively realizable, but still there's no guarantee that you know, we can really solve a target problem by these methods. So still this is a kind of open direction to explore. Then one more thing, so this is completing the independent slide. So apart from theoretical approaches of, of noise, you know, noise robust learning, we also have a very heuristic approach from the beginning. So it's called co-teaching. So in this co-teaching method, we basically use the memorization properties of neural networks. So given training points, so we perform stochastic gradient descent. Then, so we can naively obtain this kind of solution you know, within a few epochs, for example. But if we want to really fit all training data, we need to do stochastic gradient many times to you know, change the decision boundary in this way. So it takes more time to fit noisy labels. So this naively means that, so RE stopping is actually quite useful. So maybe this is a heuristic developed already in 1980s, but implementing RE stopping in the right way is actually quite difficult in practice. So we decided to use two networks actually. So th that's why it's called co-teaching. So we basically prepare two, exactly two neural, neural networks and let's call them A and B. Then A performs the mini batch training and performs static gradient descent and select some training data that has small loss values. Those small loss data are regarded as clean samples and select those clean samples and teach them to another network B. And B does the same thing. So we also perform stochastic gradient completely independently and select some small loss data and select them and teach them to A. And this is repeated several times until convergence. Then, so the final solution is trained as if they only learn from clean data. So that was the basic idea of co-teaching. Then later on, we found that teaching only disagreed data is even more effective. So in this co-teaching approach, we want A and B to be as different as possible for, for many times. Once they converge, then so we can't improve the solution anymore. So we want to make them as different as possible for many iterations. 
And once we only teach this disagreed data, we can somehow slow down the conversions and the, perform, the performance robustness is further improved. Then finally, so noisy data, so large loss data, so far we just decided to throw them away because they are just noisy data and harmful. But we found that those noisy data are also informative because we know, we are almost sure that they are noisy data. So the in intuition is something like this. So suppose we have some noisy data and we just perform gradient descent. Then, so we end up in some poor local optimum in the near future. So then this is a kind of nice precaution that, okay, this direction is actually dangerous. Then our idea is to, you know, if, if we identify noisy data, then we don't do gradient descent, but we do gradient step, gradient ascent, actually, gradient step back in such a way that we can get away from poor local optimum. Then we go back and then select another mini batch randomly here. Then the next direction may be somewhere there. Then we can somehow effectively avoid poor local optimum. So naively noisy data is useless, but we can actually use this noisy data as a kind of precaution to avoid lo poor local optimum. So this is a complete heuristic explanation and I'm not quite sure whether this really happens in reality, but in practice, it, it actually works quite well. Like for some, in some experiments, we found that even if like 50% of levels are randomly flipped, so it's completely a mess, but still like our methods can work well. So performance is improved over on training epochs. So maybe this co-teaching approach is still like we need more theoretical study to analyze why it works, but this seems to be a quite practical approach. Okay, so this is the final slide. So we are interested in, in our team. So we are interested in robust machine learning, reliable machine learning. And so far the approach I introduced, they were more like reliability for expectable situation. So this basically means we model the corruption process explicitly like noise transition matrix. And then we estimated it and corrected the solution explicitly. So this is nice if the model is correct, but in reality, maybe our like, noise assumption or corruption process assumption is not really true. Maybe we can have a good approximation, but not, never true. So then how to handle the modeling error is still a big issue here. Then another completely different approach would be, so reliability for unexpected situation. So that typical situation is the minimax gain. So we consider the worst case robustness. So in the case of noise, we don't really assume anything, but something you know, extreme can happen and we consider the worst case scenario and still minimize the loss. So it's a minimax solution basically. So this is sometimes you know, solvable mathematically and it's quite attractive theoretically, but in practice, so the solution is often too conservative. Like if, if we apply this kind of you know, solution to reinforcement learning in robot control, then the robot does not move at all. Because once we try to move the robot, there is a you know, risk of broken, broken down with some probability then not, do, doing nothing is the best solution in the minimax solution. So we need to avoid somehow this you know, too conservative solution. So that's a challenge here. Then another possibility is to include human support. Uh, in the case of classification, it's called classification with rejection. Like in medical diagnosis example, so we are given some medical images and we want to detect whether cancer exists or not. And if the, the prediction confidence is like more than 90%, maybe we can uh, believe the output of the AI system. But if the output is like 60% or 50, 55%, maybe we can't really believe it. Then, so we may ask the medical doctor to you know, handle such a situation manually. So that's a, a realistic approach in, in, in practice, but this cannot be applied for like autonomous driving cars because, you know, human drivers are no longer driving. Maybe he or she is just chatting or reading a book. So then we can't really ask them to intervene the control you know, problem. So how to handle the real time application is still an open issue here. So in practice, I think somewhere in between these two situations would be quite important. So, so far I, I didn't make any progress along this line, but I'm just saying this, but like, like we need to accept some modeling error. So this is always a true. Maybe we have some nice knowledge. So we have a approximate you know, knowledge of the model. So we have a reasonable model, but there's always a gap between the reality and, and you know, the model. So we want to take this small gap between the reality and the assumed model is an important key. 
maybe we don't really have to be completely non-parametric because we, we have certain knowledge in practice. We should definitely use it, but we, we should be sure that our knowledge is not really correct in practice. So I hope we can make some progress along this line. Thank you very much. Exactly 25 minutes. <laughs> Yes. Um, with respect to the first uh, presentation, the, uh, I really like this uh, uh, volume minimization. Oh, yeah. Volume minimization. Mm -hmm. um, so, there, the even the dimensional view is not big enough that you could just use some sort of proximal. Uh, oh, so, but this is a plus, not minus. Mm -hmm. um, so, what is the dimensions of these? The number of classes times number of classes. Okay, so you do actually, because this actually has no big complexity to a problem. This is, mm -hmm. this is super nice then. Because if you have 10 classes or 100 classes, uh, the derivative of this is just the inverse of the matrix, so you can easily do this. And the, the performance that you get out of this is significantly better, right? In, in, in principle, yes. But I, I must admit that if the number of classes if you have more than 10 or you know, 100, maybe this method does not work so well. Okay. Uh, okay. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Now, with respect to the, the second part, is, mm -hmm. it, is it also possible to think of this core teaching method as a, as a some, some sort of a learning fast and slow? Because I, I feel that one of your neural nets is learning slow, whereas the other neural net is learning fast, and you somehow balance between the two. Is, that, is, it, is it an okay way to think about it that way? Yeah, that, that's a very nice idea. So, uh, so I have no idea, to be honest. So like, we can also consider a lot of different variations of co-teaching, and like, we may even prepare the third network to do something. So, but right, so maybe maintaining diversity is somewhat important. Maybe some could learn fast and some could learn slow. Because here, the learning slow part would be getting these, let's say, the most of the data points when they have uh, consistency. That's when these linear or simpler approximations work. Mm -hmm. So this is where the slow learner would get it quickly. Mm -hmm. Whereas the fast learner would bypass this part and mm -hmm. start just overfitting everything. Right? And I, I felt that this is some something that you're exploiting here. That's why I I, uh, I, I asked. Yeah. Is it okay to think about it? Yeah. The, 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 slow learner and yeah. fast learner somehow an interplay in between. That, that, that sounds very nice, and I think from the optimization viewpoint, that could be analyzable. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But of course, the question is whether we choose the you know, final solution as one of the models, or we may take the ensemble of some yeah. different solutions. So there must be a lot of variations here. Yes. Thank you. Uh, hack results for, uh, let's say your sam distribution is perturbed, um, mm -hmm. and you want to have fine, like finite sample again. That's based on some distance between the distributions mm -hmm. p bar and p. Are there such results? Um, so in this framework, so it's just a standard you know, empirical risk minimization yes. type analysis. Right. So we didn't really consider the perturbation. No, in, sorry, I mean the hack uh, probably approximately correct, like number of samples you need. Let's say you have uh, your data for your, is a, from a perturbed distribution, but you mm -hmm. want to generalize to other another. Yeah, yeah, so, so, okay, right. For, for the first part, basically, like, like this method has such a, no, guarantee in, in the paper. I, I didn't show the convergence result here. Or you'll uh, it's a finite sample bound, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. but yeah. one of the scales of in convergence okay. Thank always. You. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you for a great talk. Um, I have a question on how to choose hyperparameters in practice. So I think for research graduate students can find mm. good hyperparameters. Uh, so like, like, <laughs> under under, yeah. <laughs> under labor noise, I uh, think. Like, like lambda here, and also yeah. like if you use stochastic gradients, so we need to tune a lot of things yeah, and yeah, yeah, neural yeah. network architecture, and, but this is always the problem, I agree. So there's so, no, how to say, good way right now. So of course there are some heuristics, yeah, and yeah, maybe yeah. Th those are written in the paper mm -hmm. or stored in the, the 
students in the brain. But yeah, so anyway, we, we need some knowledge to mm -hmm. do that. That's yeah. true. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much.